So hello, everyone, and welcome to those that are watching live, and also welcome to you who are watching the archives uh, later. My name is Randy Levante. I'm the CEO of the Canadian eLearning Network, and excited to be working with colleagues Joelle and Michael, as well as others, in looking at a real uh, important bits of research related to K-12 online learning, particularly during this pandemic. So this is a, a great session, and I'll let uh, Joelle and then Michael introduce themselves as well. We've been working on this. This is a sixth report. Go ahead, Joelle. Hi, so I'm Joelle Nagel and I'm a teacher educator in Windsor, Ontario. And I'm Mike Barber. I'm a faculty met an associate professor of instructional design down at Toro University, California. So as well is that, that Mike has been an integral person in terms of the, uh, the launching of Canny Learn uh, way back in the day and also been active in research around uh, with State of the Nation as well as other things as well. And, and uh, we've been at this now for over a year, <laughs> this whole pandemic piece. So uh, interestingly enough, so there were five previous reports not done in a chronological order, but the first one was really um, a, a derivation. And I think uh, Mike, will talk, talk a little bit more about it on some of the slides. Uh, but that was sort of a foundation journal piece uh, type of article. And then we did the sort of uh, looking at what happened in the spring of 2020, the entry into the fall, you know, what was some of the responses from folks and the feedback. And then what we did is decided we need to consolidate this into a lot more. Sorry about that one. A lot more of a report. So this is what the one that we're looking at. So um, in terms of reading, I would say the one on the top left on the gray is probably a really good piece to focus on. And then we've consolidated a lot of the information in here. We didn't pick up the uh, voices from the field. If you want to go back and look at that December report, you'll have something that's a little bit different for that. So that's kind of where we're at with, with the sessions. But a lot of this is framed around this particular graphic. So maybe, um, Michael, if you wanna just explain a little bit about what this graphic is, and it's part of that first sort of foundation report as well. Yeah, so this is um, actually was originally created by a, a educational tech blogger by the name of Phil Hill. And in that initial report, what we tried to do was pull in things that were being used in higher education and contextualize them within the K-12 environment. So one of the things that he did for us was actually modify this graphic for a more K-12 context. Um, and in particular, uh, when you're looking at sort of, I guess, what's been happening and what is likely going to continue to happen over the next little bit, um, maybe next long bit, we'll see, um, is, is you can place things within one of these four phases. Uh, so phase one was essentially what happened in March of, of um, 2020 when, you know, the, the bottom just fell out of it. Um, it's uh, commonly described as emergency remote teaching, but it's basically, you know, like the, the, the oh crap, what am I going to do now kind of moment uh, that many of us went through. Um, phase two is as we start to get comfortable in that kind of environment, we start to then look at it in a more systematic way and see, okay, what kinds of things are we missing that we really need to add back into the system to make it a more robust experience? Um, phase three, which we've taken to calling the, the toggle term or the toggle semester, the toggle year, um, after uh, some work that Brian Alexander has done, basically is when the system itself has prepared and is ready to be able to go from online to face-to-face -face and back and forth, depending upon what the epidemiology of the pandemic is. And then phase four is basically what's going to happen, what things are going to look like when this is all said and done. Um, so obviously, as we look across the country right now, one of the things that you'll see, and you've probably noticed this in your own experiences, is depending on who you're working with, they're somewhere between phase two and phase three. And it's amazing that we are some 18 months into this and there are still folks that haven't really transitioned into that phase three area, which uh, Randy's gonna talk about a little bit in a bit. 
thank you. Sorry, I got to remember to turn my mic on. I'm turning it off because of the background noise. So a couple of things that when we first got into this was there was a lot of confusion around uh, and calling what was occurring in remote learning, online learning. So Karen, as you're, you're probably quite well aware of. So people were talking about pivot and I, I have an issue with that word because in education, we don't pivot. We're a freighter. You don't pivot a freighter. So it's, it's a, a misnomer that's continued, but it's really trying to shift what you're doing in the classroom online is what people were trying to do. And the primary objective is to try to build some sort of a relationship and continuity, but it wasn't really planned for, uh, and it really wasn't designed for that kind of remote access. So a lot of folks turn to the synchronous tools like Zoom, and we have Zoom School um, is essentially, which is still used a lot. And that's not to denigrate, you know, that active teams or synchronous kind of connection, because uh, as we all know, that can promote conversation, which is an important part. But if you're trying to do didactic teaching through the, the vehicle, it becomes really problematic in terms of the pedagogy. It's not necessarily a well thought out or designed piece. So that's part of the, the, the issue. But when we look at online learning, it starts from a premise of sort of almost an individual that is engaging in the learning content with some level of support with purpose. It's systematic, you know, in terms of course development, selections of tools are purposeful, consideration about the, the, the environments, whether they be live synchronous, uh, and a lot of adaptation to having students come face to face when and as required, but also there's very specific teacher training to support that. So that distinction is, is, is really primarily important because there's still many people that use the term online and online learning, and it has a very different meaning because they're really talking about Zoom school. <laughs> so when you, we look back and look at the sort of the plans around continuity, there was differences that happened across Canada, which were really important. Ontario first offered the virtual schools, but it was really looking at hybrid synchronous types of learning approaches. Um, and then, you know, expectations for remote learning were, were brought in uh, where parents demanded that at the start of uh, the school year last year after the, the, the freak out in the spring of 2020. Um, but it's in many cases, still curriculum assessments reporting were kind of laxed. So what that meant is, is the, um, sorry, and thank you and welcome, Sarah. Um, what that meant is there was still as a bit of a foot off the gas kind of thing for a lot of students and, and teachers. So it really, what's been going on in terms of instruction has been a little bit limited, perhaps, and not certainly not what we expected in what we had prior to the pandemic. So um, when we started now in terms of the, this particular school year, there are plans still like they were last year. The plan was for sort of a normal return to school with health and safety protocols. But uh, some jurisdictions dropped uh, offering remote learning as an option and rather than and sort of push people into either you're going to pick one of our online learning programs or you're going to be in the classroom and then if we have to close a school because of pandemic then we'll figure something out or the school will figure something out <laughs> which which really it's sometimes without plans because there's a lot of scramble in the spring to put them in so there were some differences that really started to show up across uh, the country so um, we mentioned about Ontario's virtual school um, and with students remaining you know, fully remote, but that was to combine. Uh, and when they tried to budget for it, they didn't actually get any money. So that meant that boards were forced to kind of use one teacher to kind of do both. Um, and that be created some, some problems with the start of the year. Um, but remote learning was offered still with others as well. But there, again, back to in terms of what happened, was that necessarily didn't work well as there was a lot of quarantines and individual classes sent home without really necessarily the supports, which goes back to a primary argument or observation or both, that there really wasn't a focus on preparing in the same way. So as we look back over that school year, I think that you know there's certain things that did happen that we can pr pretty much put into this model. So Michael, I'm gonna let you explain this model. Sure. Basically, I mean, this is a more descriptive than anything, uh, but what types of things we saw happening uh, in the, the past school year. Um, so 
most of them at the beginning of the year had some form of either in-person, as Randy mentioned, or distance option. And you had to pick one or the other in most jurisdictions. Um, and in that in-person, depending upon what was happening within the, uh, the, the regional area, in some cases, it was just regular face-to-face -face instruction like we would have seen for the last 100 years, 120, 150 years. In some cases, it was the, the concurrent teaching or the, the, the co-seeding or co-locating that we've talked about where you're finding um, that example Randy talked about where I'm teaching 12 students in the room and another 15 students at home at the same time. Basically, what I'm doing in the classroom is just being streamed to them. And then the, the third option we often saw was some form of, of truly hybrid learning where you were coming to school sometimes, learning online sometimes, and oftentimes they would have the class broken up into you know, two or three different pairings, if you will. And if you were in group one, you went to school on Mondays and Tuesdays and alternating Fridays and that kind of thing. Um, obviously, when schools closed down, all of the ones on the the top area, that, that group in blue there, would have to shift to some sort of temporary form of remote learning. And that tended to be what we saw throughout the 2020-21 the school year. Thank you. Thank you, Zoom, for prompting me to turn my mic back on. Um, arguably, when you look back, you know, was it really phase three in terms of toggling and, and switching and seamlessly shifting between remote and on, in, in class? No, arguably because it, depending on the levels of supports or the actual instructional model design, it really was still just adding in basics uh, as best as could. So um, and you have to remember that's against the backdrop of um, the students thinking, okay, well, I'm kind of just I'm here just to engage and connect with the school but it's not because I'm really focused on getting where I want to. So that's why we're also hearing a lot of reports of students that are feeling like they're not ready to hit first year college and university because they kind of feel like they left out and lost out on a lot of things uh, when they were doing. So, so the, the idea about toggling um, you know, is, is not consistent when you look nationally. Although arguably in looking at a few places, there was some specific approaches that were taken. So for example, in Nova Scotia, they delayed school opening for a week in order to upscale their teachers on, on things. Um, and that wasn't necessarily the case in other jurisdictions. In BC, they were going to change the whole funding model uh, around the online schools. Uh, and that was creating issues last year where they were concerned they were going to collapse and close their programs. And <laughs> those of us at BC know the angst and anguish that still continues because of these policies. It's that BC delayed that, which was part of their strategic decision to say in 2021 and actually 2020, both school starts, is that you pick online or you pick in school. Um, so, but what also what's happened now at the start of 21 is that Quebec Anglophone uh, boards have, uh, have come together to create one virtual school for those students who have a medical exemption to not come into the school building. Now they specify medical exemption, but I'm not sure how necessarily that uh, is defined and or enforced. So it is an option for remote learning, um, but it's done as it's shared through the board, which is interesting because they've actually gone to an organization to learn, which is one of the founding members of Canny Learn, um, which has specific teachers and training and affordances towards the online learning. So arguably, perhaps it's better. I say perhaps. <laughs> So the question is, was there necessary preparation for the expected phase three toggle? Some closed individual schools only. So there was a continued enactment and engagement in schools. So there was some necessary continuing. However, others locked down schools for 14 to 16 weeks in jurisdictions, just provincially. So instead of uh, sort of a more gradual region by region kind of approach, some provinces were like all or nothing, all wide open or just shut right down, which has, of course, its impact. Um, some had robust online learning programs. Others didn't necessarily invest in what they had already. 
and use them uh, for that, instead relying on just remote learning and expecting and assuming teachers would be able to manage that. So what the results were, as we look back and reflect on it, it's certainly inequitable what happened and the varied policies, plans and practices, only some were successful, but we don't really know that. We just know that anecdotally. So that kind of lays the foundation for where we think we should be going. So this one, and, and Mike, you want to jump in and explain this as well. This was put together by um, a science advisory panel in, I think they out of Toronto or was it Ottawa, where they, the, the panel was. And they went back and they looked at school closures across Canada. CBC published this as well. Um, and so these were averages because when you look at it, it doesn't tell the whole story. So in British Columbia, um, none of the, there was no province-wide lockdown of schools. Yet on average, uh, they make estimations that schools were closed probably around nine weeks uh, throughout the last the, uh, the school years. In Alberta, there were province-wide, Saskatchewan had them, certainly in Nova Scotia, which really started with sort of a blended approach and already had a robust system. There were actual province-wide because um, they, their tolerance level in health was different say from British Columbia, which had numbers which were high like Ontario's numbers, but Ontario did province-wide closures, BC did not. Um, you know, Nova Scotia, is the, they closed very quickly because, you know, of the fact it's a very small population and trying to protect. So all of the health authorities had different approaches, um, which affected then how schools were remained open or closed. Any, Michael, any comments on that as well? No, I don't have any additional ones. I think you covered them pretty good. Yeah, so, so what we saw in the toggling along period as well is that Ontario um, in launching as well evolved very quickly into a remote learning requirement policy, which was put into place to ensure continuity of learning. So they made the policy, but there necessarily wasn't a plan for how that would be enacted. BC said, we're gonna stop messing around, delay messing around with the online schools because we're gonna tell you, you either pick a distance learning option or you're going to school. And we're not gonna necessarily plan for remote learning. In Nova Scotia, the policies were adjusted and adapted, but what happens in Nova Scotia is the online, one online school, and that's run by the Department of Education. So again, these differences really show a lot in that's happening. And I mentioned Quebec had an insistence from the ministry that all instruction was in person, not believing that online learning was a suitable uh, place for us to mandate as a government or as a ministry. But I mentioned the consortium that evolved as well. And there were also refat and other francophone uh, options around distance learning that did exist to fill the gaps but from the ministry's perspective, it was there to fill gaps. It was not as a primary means of instruction, which other provinces look at it differently. So anything else, Joel or, or Michael, that maybe that comes to mind for you? No, it's pretty comprehensive, I, I think. So, yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd add back on the last yeah. slide, uh, Randy, you know, one of the, the things that we've seen in a lot of jurisdictions, and I'll use my own home province as a good example of this, you know, the, there's a virtual school there, province-wide virtual school, the Center for Distance Learning and Innovation that's run by the English language school district. So there's only one school district in the province. So they run all of the English language schools. So everyone except for maybe a half dozen French language schools, they run the virtual school. They have almost the complete high school curriculum covered off in terms of asynchronous online content uh, since 2000 and actually since 99, 2000, they probably have maybe 60 to 70 individuals throughout the province that have taught in this program that they could have relied upon. Um, when both this coming, you know, this year that we're in now, the fall of 2021, plus the previous year, um, when they shifted to remote learning, teachers in the province didn't use the learning management system that the virtual school had in place. They didn't use any of the content that the 
first the department and now the school district has spent literally thousands, well, I would say hundreds of thousands of dollars because I know over the years I've been paid about $15,000 to develop or redevelop a couple of courses. And that's only, I think, two different courses of the 30 odd that they have or 40 odd that they have. So, um, you know, all of those resources were essentially not used for the remote learning aspect. And I think that'll speak to the, the distinction between an, a jurisdiction that's that Randy was referring to, like say Nova Scotia or some of the others where they really have planned for that toggle compared to say Newfoundland where you know they're really not even using the resources that they have available to them to plan for that toggle. And, and I would say to a certain extent, and Joel, I'm not to put you on the spot because you're not teaching engaged well, but um, to a certain extent, Ontario had the assets as well with a, a central provincial LMS, centrally provided and developed courses, et cetera, as well as a whole consortium of boards, the Anglophone and the Francophone boards that, that produce and share online content and students across as well. Yet, I don't know that there was necessarily, other than TVO resources, there wasn't really a plan for your regular classroom teacher to access in or training to do the, use those tools. No, like nothing. So my husband was teaching in the K-12 during that time. And there, there we had the website, the ministry website, which just sort of was mostly geared towards parents, I think, to access curriculum and ask, ask like the TVO videos and, and st stuff like that but there was nothing to support the teachers to help them make that shift or rely on anything else that was available and, and, and for karen and sarah who are in in the room with as well um, none of that training about doing building your course and materials into an online environment that's accessible from classroom or distance and then focusing on using interactive activities, group work, that sort of thing, when you've got students together synchronously, which is a, a shift from a classroom teacher's perspective, who's usually facilitating and doing that day in and day out, um, to put, push yourself online. And all of us that have shifted from synchronous and classroom or room stuff online, was not an easy shift to do at first to get your mind thinking differently. So I'm not sure whether any of our audience wants to share any anecdotal comments or stories. I'm coming from a little bit of a different perspective because I worked in an online school before COVID. So it's kind of like we were doing online school before it was popular. <laughs> so we didn't really have that same experience with the pivot or the toggle because this, the teachers who are coming to us are coming fully knowing they're getting into this online DL environment. Mm -hmm. um, but this is definitely a gap that we've identified is even the teachers who are coming and the fact that they want to work in this environment, the training just isn't there. Like we've had to create in-house training and the learning curve is just so steep, even for very experienced classroom teachers. Um, so I, we're looking at how can we get into teacher education programs where there can be even a little bit of um learning how to teach online putting in that e-pedagogy so that teachers are prepared if they decide they want to teach this route or if they get into a classroom that has a hybrid option right or even themselves to take an online course as part of their program but then so, that gets into how are we training university faculty to teach online because <laughs> you don't want to joelle's wheelhouse now yeah, so that's you, you bring up a really good point. So I'm teaching at the Faculty of Education at the University of Windsor. And so um, we had some faculty training before going into the 20, um, 20, 2021 semester because all of our teacher education was online. So it does identify that we don't have any courses available for our students. And so it was sort of upon us to build that into the program. And so for my, for example, for my second year, secondary teachers in their, their English language arts class, the whole, I tried to shift it as let's, you know, you've already had a year of building up your lessons and doing that. How about we focus this year when you're doing your lessons and your, your units and thinking about it all online and trying to really kind of source information to, to offer them that was accessible to help them rethink that. 
because otherwise we don't have anything that's there for them as a resource. So it was sort of, if you want to build that into your into your education program, yes, but otherwise it wasn't available. Right. Yeah, and and I think that there's there's a number of things uh, that we need to take right now. We don't have the luxury of waiting. I think to improve what our practices, because I mean, when we look at what is prepared, you know, right now the the best of what we can see is that. BC again decided to delay their changes because most of the programs in BC doubled in size, uh, a lot of them in terms of parents and students opting for that uh, because they didn't want their kids to go into a school to be tossed out and locked down and et cetera, et cetera. Nova Scotia did some surveying around parents because they distributed a whole bunch of materials, um, internet connectivity out to parents in a lot of the remote areas, et cetera. And so they reported about 75 to 80% of the parents reported that they had really good connectivity in the house. So they could actually shift them online as well. And they did announce uh, requirements for teachers that if they're teaching, um, you know, re doing remote learning, so to speak, they're teaching uh, both asynchronously and synchronously. And they specified that in their announcements that, that they expected that, but they also upskilled their teachers to do that kind of thing. Um, and then arguably as well with the model that was launched in, in Ontario, you know, with concurrent teaching, you know, if, assuming it was effective, it would be, have the ability to shift quite easily because that's, well, you know, in, in post-secondary, a lot of folks are talking about high flex where the learner has the individual choice to come into the classroom, into the, you know, the seminar, the lecture, wherever it is that they want to go, or they can just catch it online. So they have that flexibility. That might, might, might work in post-secondary, but it's a very different client base in K to 12 and with a very different needs that, that happen. So, you know, when we go back to the model, arguably they could toggle, but in reality, how effective are any of those approaches really being, which is, which is where, where we want to go with this in terms of the fact that already we're getting school closures, you know, uh, with regional and local outbreaks that are happening. So this is, we're going through another year like we did last year. So, how are the differences in policy and practice going to emerging and how effective are they to be guiding politicians and policymakers about another toggle year or continuing this? Because in New Brunswick, they had a strike and they tossed all kids online to be learning <laughs> online. So they didn't have to, and teachers didn't cross in, into, a, a, you know, across a picket line. There, there are other reasons and have been lots of other reasons why schools have had to close, you know, because for uh, other reasons, I mean, um, where was it in the, uh, the power outage in, in again, this was in, in BC just the other day, they did, they closed the schools because they didn't have power. So there's lots of disruption that we tend to forget about. Uh, and in Ontario, there was a, a lot of talk at the beginning of the, the year, uh, the school year, about snow days, about using remote learning for snow days, because they lose anywhere from five to 10 days of instruction in a, a school because they're closed because you can't access and get in the building. So we know this is gonna carry on. We know it and it, it will, we can't ignore it. It's not going back to normal. So what is that new normal? So this is where a lot of the interest that, that we have is it's sort of about what, what it would be towards a new normal. So the question is, what will this look like when we go forward? What lessons do we take forward to help inform that? And how will the next, uh, what happens over the 18 months guide both short and long-term closures during the next disaster? And I think we don't have enough information to do that. We might have a slightly um, uh, anecdotal, slightly informed opinion but I think that we really need to focus on a lot more. So I'm just gonna finish this in discussion because one of the things which we believe we can do as Canny Learn is to actually ask the question, how do we do in remote learning? How do we leverage our network to find out some data about successes or challenges or failures in strategies that were put in place? And then with a policy think tank approach, is that how can we help to inform policy which supports practice 
that is effective for those at that senior level? How did they arrive at the decisions that they made? Because I kind of know Ontario backed into hybrid because of um, the requirements for remote and the desire to have students have continuity of learning, but yet the funding model didn't allow and they're forced into one classroom teacher having to manage both. Whereas BC made a policy decision that said, we're going to either have one of the existing online programs that you go to, or you're in the classroom. So we're not gonna give you that option for a gap between. And how successful is that? Nova Scotia had their own approach in terms of running it out of the Department of Ed with their one online school, and they just basically decreed this is where you're going to go and upskilled their teachers to make sure because they had the responsibility for it. But in Ontario, the Ministry of Education offers support and resources, but doesn't actually manage or have much to do with the practice. So I guess that's the question in terms of fundamentally where we want to go. So I'm going to stop there and just open it up for some questions uh, for folks. Comments, add additions, Michael, Joel, around where we've been. I guess just as a, a, a comment for Ontario, I think the, the issue of the funding is, is really interesting because they the ministry is mandating now that we do the hybrid, they're mandating that the boards all, you know, farm out technology and all that kind of thing, but there's absolutely no funding for it. And so each school board has had to create a virtual school where they've taken their teachers out of the classroom for that specifically and principals allocated and stuff, but there's absolutely no funding um, extra. So boards then for other programs and, and staffing and such are, are experiencing a lot of um, challenges and shortages. For sure. Um, just for those that are watching on the recording, I'm just going to share once more here. So just so you know that you can access all of these reports on our Google site is the simplest place to, to find all of that with all the research reports and we'll be posting as well this this uh, archive onto that site. Um, and we are going to continue to look at this as research uh, to come forward. So we may be knocking on the doors of some folks um, that you know or are aware of with parts of this, because I think we need to learn more, but also to inform better in terms of those particular practices and pieces which we, which we have. So um, I wanna thank everyone. At this point, I'm gonna turn off the recording, uh, but then leave it open for discussion for the rest of us here. So those watching, thank you. Visit our website, off you go.